Well, once again, Muslim terrorists a terrorist have slaughtered attack. innocent Islamic people extremists the now Islamic control parts of the country. The rise Their brand of, Islam of justice is Nazism. brutal and deadly. News flash, America. These Muslim extremists are, uh, are alive and well. They are not dead. And their video is not gratuitous. And it certainly is not irrelevant. It is a warning. Welcome to the Truth About Muslims podcast, the official podcast of the Zwemer Center for Muslim Studies where we help to educate you beyond the media. Here are your hosts, Howard and Trevor. You are listening to Truth About Muslims podcast. Truthaboutmuslims.com And what we try to do every week, and, and if you're a regular listener, what you'll notice, what we try to do is that we want to help Christians uh, to be able to see Muslims outside of what the media uh, tells us about them and to actually see them as people, as Christ would. Yeah, I mean... In the past few weeks, even over Christmas, there's been a lot in the news about Muslims, and uh, we're going to get into some of that today. In particularly, I was thinking about the uh, the stuff going on in Australia. Yeah, that, I think that's like the perfect example. And what's what's a, uh, this is what hurts me a little bit is that this wasn't done by Christians per se. Um, th- this thing that we're about to talk to you about it, it's just normal people. Hey, we don't know. They might be Christians. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping they are. I'm hoping they are. Um, but there, there, there's been this huge, huge. Um, uh, uprising, not uprising, but does, does this movement, a social media movement, right? They, and, basically, uh, a couple of weeks, uh, like last week, Howard was really sick and, uh, he sent me, he sent me a text and said, Hey, have you, have you seen I'll ride with you? Um, the hashtag. And I thought, no, I have no idea what you're talking about. He said, you got to watch it. He said, maybe it's that I'm a little bit sick, but it almost made me cry. So well, I'm no, really, no, I, mean, <laughs> I, I was, I was, I was really emotional. I don't, I don't know. Listeners, please. If you, uh, if you feel this way, then, you know, you get what I'm saying, but like when I'm sick, I just kind of get emotional. I, I I actually cried in the Apple ad. Apple put out this, you know, these little blurpies. They're you know, so good. Christ- those Apple Christ- ads. Christmas ads, and I, I seriously, I was I was crying. And I showed my wife, and my wife is an emotional person too. And my wife, she just looks at me She's like, like, oh, that's what's a good ad. what's the matter with you? <laughs> <laughs> well, Howard Howard sends me this uh, this text saying you got to check out um, I'll ride with you and. I had no idea what it was, but I, you know, I was humored because he said it almost made him cry, which means it probably made him cry. Right, um, it did. So I, I went and I checked it out, and seriously, I got teary eyed myself. Right, and I, and I wasn't sick, and I'm not a very emotional person. And, I, yeah, yeah. So there was this article. It was uh, Australians just showed the world exactly how to respond to terrorism with hashtag I'll ride with you. And if you're not familiar with hashtags, I don't, I don't know. Uh, all of our listenerships might not know. Go to Google. <laughs> right, and you can basically you you type in the the, the pound symbol and. Um, you can type in, you know, without spaces, just any kind of topic. And you, people put it on Facebook, people put it on Twitter. And, you know, you can click on those and it'll take you to other feeds that show all of those people that have used that hashtag. So it's pretty cool. And in this hashtag, it was I'll ride with you. So Trevor, you take this story now. Well, I mean, basically we're dealing with the, the hostage crisis in downtown Sydney, Australia. And so this is classic, um, basically what's happening all around the Western world something happens, uh, it's perpetuated by, it's done by, by Muslims, and it's done typically in the name of Islam. And so there's an automatic response, usually from the people to think, well, there we go. There's the true nature of Islam. All Muslims are blank. Islamophobia. There you go. And so uh, basically, the Australians responded in a completely different way. I mean, it was, it was seriously challenging. And I, and I do hope that as Christians, we would be uh, humbled by this response, I think. And maybe these people are Christian, maybe they're not, I don't know. But go ahead, Howard. What? Yeah, so there's this woman, uh, uh, Rachel Jacobs, she's tweeting, and she writes uh, in a two-part tweet, and, uh, and this is dot, 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 and, and, the, and, and the Muslim woman next to me on the train silently removes her hijab. And this is after they find out this hostage situation is happening the uh, some of the attackers put the uh, Islam, uh, an Islamic flag in the cafe window. And then after that, it says, I ran after her at the train station. I said, put it back on. She's talking to this Muslim woman. Put it back on. I'll walk with you. She started to cry and hugged me for about a minute, then walked off alone. And so after that, right after that, somebody writes another um, uh, another tweet and just says, uh, you know, if there's anybody else out there... Um, you know, if you regularly take, you know, so-and-so bus, uh, wear re- and re- wear religious attire and don't feel safe alone, I'll ride with you. Uh, just hit me up for a schedule. And then then that person writes, uh, maybe start a hashtag, what's, uh, what's in hashtag I'll ride with you. And then literally 
it was like a hot in 12 hours 150,000 tweets with out hashtag I'll ride with you pops up where people are just going crazy just saying I'll ride with you if you're wearing religious attire and you don't feel safe I'll ride with you this is where I'm this is the bus I'm riding this is the train I'm riding subway I'm riding I'll ride with you and it's all over Australia it was so cool and for me it was just it was encouraging because I think sometimes you feel like um I don't know you you see so much hate and you see so much frustration and to see 150,000 people all being willing to say hey if if you're Muslim and you wear the hijab um I'll ride with you that that for me was a very encouraging moment in knowing that there are people out there that can still display the image of God believers or non-believers in my mind that kind of sacrificial love is the image of God being displayed in humanity. I was encouraged by it. I don't know that I got as weepy as Howard, but I did get a little weepy. Well, I read some of the other tweets, and this one was from a Muslim woman. She says, I was going to drive to work tomorrow, but seeing the outpouring of support changed my mind. Hashtag, I'll ride with you. Thank you. See you on the train. I thought that was so cool. Mm -hmm. I thought that was so Mm -hmm. cool. Uh, Because, I mean, the Australian people, and I I know some Aussies, and uh, last week's Peter Riddell, uh, another Aussie, and uh, it's really kind of neat to see how they just think differently. Yeah, um, yeah. and you know, I, I would hope for our, uh, our American public that we would, we would follow suit and especially the church, especially the church. Yeah. We should be the first saying, I'll ride with you. I will love you. Um, I will be a friend. I will be, uh, a fellow citizen that is about, you know, people. So right. anyway, I, Howard, in one, in one thought I just had, I did see this, uh, about a, I think it was about a year ago with a, an American soccer player. What do you mean? A uh, high school soccer team, and the young Muslim girl came out to play soccer, and the, the referee told her she couldn't wear her hijab. Oh, right, yeah. right, right, right. And uh, the FIFA had already ruled on this, that you're allowed to wear that as part of the uniform, but this referee wouldn't let her play. And so the next time that ref was uh, refing, the entire team showed up wearing the hijab in support of their Muslim friend. I mean, that's that's pretty amazing love and care yeah, for a friend. And so they just kind of stood with her and wore the hijab. And, right. Yeah. Anyway. And, and you know what my guess would be? My guess would be that those girls on that team um, that are standing in solidarity with their Muslim friend would uh, actually never have a problem seeing Muslims as human beings. No, because they know one. Right. And that, that's what I hear actually with kids. Uh, in, like, you know, I'm a youth pastor and all the kids that I deal with they don't really have problems with Muslims because they know Muslims at school and they're friends with Muslims at school. So it's not like this monster that, that media portrays. But I think a lot of Americans, we don't, we don't know enough Muslims. And that's what kind of leads us to the next point because we were going to actually talk about uh, Henry Martin today. Yeah, yeah, life of Henry Martin. So we're going to do some practical Muslim evangelism from the life of Henry Martin. And, and on this show, you hear a lot of our, our, our guest speakers come in or uh, interviews. Um, talking about, you know, just reaching out. And I love this, I'll ride with you. This woman, you know, just sits next to this woman on a train and, and tells her, no, 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 don't take it off. Don't take off your hijab. You know, I'll be with you. I'll walk with you, you know. And it's like just that human touch. And I think that's a, I think that's a great segue to this practical evangelism because, uh, you know, Trevor and I were talking about how hard it is to, you know, you get kind of get confused with all the information that's kind of coming at you, maybe even on this show. And you're trying to think about, you know, how am I going to actually do this? So Henry Martin, who is no longer alive, it's, you know, 100, 200 years ago, uh, but he has some great, great stuff. So Trevor, take it away. Yeah, well, we got to start with David Brainerd because Henry Martin was one of those young guys that had read the diary of David Brainerd and was so inspired that he felt like he wanted his life to emulate David Brainerd. And it's uncanny how much their lives sort of parallel. They both died young. Both. I mean, what, David Brainerd, uh, 29, 29, and and Henry Martin, I think, was 31. 31, that's correct. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, Howard, you've read... uh, Diary of David Brainerd. Yes. Give us a little bit on David Brainerd first. David Brainerd was huge, impactful in my life because, you know, I don't know about you, but in this day and age with, uh, you know, missionaries and stuff like that, people try to create some hype. You know, like we're trying to get support. We're going to do great things for God and all this kind of stuff. And David Brainerd's diary is nothing like that. It, you know, talks about his story, his, uh, what had happened in his early childhood. But um, prone to melancholy. Right. He had depression. He struggled with all these kind of things. But, you know, so he was going, uh, he gets saved when he's around 21 meets the Lord for real, and then uh, he decides to go into Yale, 
Uh, I think actually he was planning on going to Yale before that, but uh, you know, to, for his seminary degree. Yeah, I don't think most people realize that Yale was at one point a theological institution. <laughs> right. I and mean, they still have an MDiv program at Yale, and they do still do theology, but that was really the bread and butter of Yale back in the day. Right. A lot of these colleges were like that, or right. universities. The so, Ivy Leagues. Right. Anyway, so David Brainerd goes there, but he gets expelled because this great yes. awakening happens. <laughs> like spiritual things are going crazy. Like people are going crazy. These students are like, are meeting the Lord, and like all these miraculous things are happening. The, the problem was, that the students were more on fire, more zealous for Jesus than the faculty. Right, and the faculty wanted it to stop. They're like, this is ridiculous, right? And so they they uh, they get... Uh, Jonathan Edwards. <laughs> to come in. They're like, let's get Jonathan Edwards in here and he'll calm them down. Right, and then Jonathan Edwards proceeds to preach on like the exact opposite. He was Ultimate basically backfire. saying that this was... Oh, an awakening. This was a, go- a move of God. And of course, the faculty weren't happy. No, they weren't happy. And they actually come up with some rules yeah, like, saying, like, if anybody, anybody suggests that the faculty or the trustees or, you know, deans, if anybody suggests any of these faculty and administrative people are somehow carnal. Yeah, hypocrites. Hypocrites. Unconverted men. Un- <laughs> <laughs> unconverted the first punishment will be uh i think it was public repentance right, right? they have to confess in the hall uh, okay right confession in the hall in front of everybody and then the second one is expulsion and and david brainerd I, and this is the other thing i noticed about missionaries is missionaries i think are a different breed of people they're they're more akin i think in my heart to to like entrepreneurs where they just kind of they they go after it you know, they just go out. They lack the front, the prefrontal cortex. Right. There's no. There's no. Uh, he didn't. Think oh, it warning! He warning! Just you know, he just went for uh, it. No words filter. are coming out of my mouth. Oh no! You know, and so uh, he says this ridiculous thing, and I want to. I want to read it to you. Okay. Uh, he says of one of his tutors, he says, has no more grace than a chair. Mm-hmm. And that he wondered why the rector did not drop down dead for finding students for their evangelical zeal. So I think he was probably just saying this with his buddies, right? Right, just goofing He's off. He's just like, man. That guy's you know, like, you know. He has no no more grace in that tree right there. Right. You know, but he gets turned in. Yeah, he gets turned in and he gets expelled. Full on expelled. So his the direction dreams, he was going. Yeah, the dreams direction. of becoming a pastor, getting his MDiv and all that good and stuff. And he was like the top Done. of his class. This was his junior year, his third year. So, Done. Like it. Yeah, and and uh, and he got tuberculosis. Right, and he had tuberculosis. He was spitting up blood. His he second year, he had to actually too. leave. Yeah, his first year, he got measles. So I don't know what was going on. So if there was a reason to be prone to melancholy, he had it. Right, and so he, you know, he gets this opportunity because you know he wanted to be a missionary to the Indians, and he thought that had died, but then he was uh, um, uh, approached by this organization, <laughs> and get this, it's the sponsorship of the commissioners of the society in Scotland for propagating Christian knowledge. Mm, the Scottish will take them on. C O S S P C K. Yeah, that's a good acronym there. Well, anyway, so they they you know, they 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 pick him up and he becomes a, a missionary to the Indians. You know what though, he's still I mean, in reality, he's a pretty ineffective missionary so far as how we measure these things, right? This is what I love about the difference between our economy and God's economy, because we're looking at this, and if we only were living as contemporaries of David Brainerd, we would have probably sneered and been like, man, not, not too effective. Right, because I mean, handful of converts. Yeah, there were converts, uh, handful, but they weren't like in droves. He wasn't leading entire tribes to the Lord, kind of thing. And he dies at such a young age of tuberculosis. But yeah, wait, there is it, Jonathan Edwards is the one who cares for him. His daughter Jerusha Edwards. All right. right, Nicholas Sparks has got nothing on this story. This is like the ultimate Nicholas Sparks love story coming out summer 2015. Right. So, <laughs> and so uh, you know, after enduring all these hardships, David Brainerd basically comes home because he's dying of tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, and uh, his mentor is like Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan, Jonathan Edwards loves him. He's the actually he's the guy that actually compiles his diary. Mm-hmm. Publishes but his, his diary. but he's in love. David Brainerd's in love with his daughter Jerusha. Uh, Jerusha's in love with David Brainerd, so she nurses him uh, basically until he he passes away. And Jonathan Edwards knows he knows that his daughter will get tuberculosis if she mm-hmm. does this, and she she does. She, she gets does. tuberculosis and she dies. I'm not, I could be mistaken on this. I don't think that I am. This could be Christian urban legend, but I think she dies a year later on Valentine's Day. Oh, really? I'm serious. That's depressing. 
No, dude, that's Nicholas Sparks' novel. <laughs> the the thing is, uh, on an interesting side note, is my uh, my middle daughter. My well, I have two daughters. My second daughter, uh, her middle name is Drusha because that 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 whole thing just that sacrificial love just really on both parts, on Jonathan Edwards' parts and Drusha's parts, just really just uh, it spoke to me in such a deep degree. So I I, I named my uh, my second daughter Drusha middle. But you need to name. look that up that February fourteenth thing because I'm pretty sure it's true. Anyway, let's move on. It, it's not. A, podcast on David Brainerd, but right, you have right. to talk about David Brainerd to get to Henry Martin. Cause yeah, because you kind of get the idea of what David Brainerd went through, and Henry Martin, when he reads this, he's overwhelmed, kind of like I was, and then go. And, and every other missionary since then has been so inspired by David Brainerd's story, and it kind of makes you realize that the people that we often prop up as the leaders of Christianity, we would not have propped up David Brainerd. Right, because he was down in the dumps. He was suffering and... Uh, he was quiet. Oh, he, uh, Jonathan Edwards actually made this point. He said he wished he was more like David Brainerd because David Brainerd, when he looked at nature, he didn't care. Where D- Jonathan Edwards would walk through the woods and be lost in God, you know, being in the nature, just being so moved by nature. But David Brainerd was so focused. He didn't care about nature. He was depressed. He was just, he even had a hard time loving the people that he was called to. It's really interesting. It's real vulnerable, real, and, real life. And isn't there a moment where he actually goes out to pray and he comes out of his prayer and he has melted the snow around him. Right. And uh, some of his I've prayers never are melted snow with prayer. <laughs> some of his prayers that were really gut wrenching is that he really was lonely. Like he wanted another Christian brother to come and they can talk about God and, and mutually encourage each other. It was so, so depressing. We he w- felt so alone. We would have definitely told David Brainerd to get, get in counseling and, and just not to do ministry, but somehow God used that part of his life to be what ministers to so many other people. Right. And I think that's pretty encouraging because there's a lot of folks out there that are like, man, I'm just not wired like some of these radical guys. And I'm thinking, well, thank God, because yeah. we need the whole body of Christ. We need the David Brainers. We need the melancholy, those who are suffering with real issues of right. depression and things and to, to speak into the life of the body of Christ. So anyway, spoke into Henry Martin's life, inspired Henry Martin. Henry Martin goes out as a missionary to the subcontinent of India. He's traveling around northern India, ends up in Persia, translates the Bible, Persian, Arabic, um, there's another uh, Urdu, and he's just this prolific Bible translator, incredibly effective in Bible translation. Very and young, very still, very young. Very young. Also, there's a love story there. You can go read that in his own uh, diary writings, but he has a love story too. There's a, a, a deep love he has for this woman back home, but she does not want to go to the mission field, and they're kind of parting of ways for the uh, Henry Martin's pursuing uh, the, the missionary life, and it's a pretty intense story. But from Henry Martin, we see these principles of evangelism. And this came out of an article that was written uh, for Urbana several years ago. I just mm. kind of came across it. And as I looked at these principles of evangelism that come from the life of Henry Martin, I realized something. If I'm only given 20 minutes and somebody says, give me the, the, the overview, what should we know about ministering to Muslims? I go to this. Wow. Wait, you've taught this in class too. Yeah, no, this is what... Th- this is the last lecture I give, and I teach a course on Muslim evangelism. The very last lecture is on these seven principles, because I say, if you forget everything else, remember this, because anybody can do this. And listeners, you remember, I'm the guy that doesn't know anything. I'm just kind of here on the ride, and I'm hopefully somewhat entertaining. But anyway, Trevor is saying these things, that I'm, I haven't even heard them yet, so I'm pretty excited about it. So go away. I mean, go away. Go, go Get go, out of here. <laughs> go ahead, Trevor. All right, I'll start with uh, Henry Martin's realization that his uh, he, went, he went with the original intention of, because again, he is brilliant like David Brainerd, top of his class, brilliant in mathematics, and everybody said he was selling himself short by going to the mission field, that he could have become one of the brilliant minds. Instead, he joins the Anglican church and becomes an Anglican missionary. Wow. Now, when he gets out to the field, he's thinking that I'm going to convince these Muslims through mathematics, through reasoning, through all of you know his huh. brilliance, he's going to use apologetics, basically, and win wait, the wait. Muslim world. So you want us to use math to witness to... No, this oh, is what he comes okay. to realize. And Raymond Law had a similar approach. He says, frigid reasoning with men of perverse minds seldom brings men to Christ. How powerless are the best directed arguments unless the Holy Ghost renders them effectual. Ooh, I like that. We just don't talk like that anymore. I know. We don't even say Holy Ghost. I don't know. Maybe you come from a Pentecostal church, but I like Holy it. Holy Ghost. So he basically says that his reasoning was useless. And that none of his arguments were working. And so he takes a totally different approach. And believe it or not, it's a relational approach. So the show wouldn't be possible without sponsors. And this week's sponsors are... Zwammer Center. Zwammer Center. Zwammer Center. The Zwammer Center. Zwammer Center. 
And what does the Zwamer Center do? Uh, talks about Muslims and, and tells them on the computer that we love you. Very nice. The Zwemer Center equips the church to reach Muslims. The Zwemer Center has been educating people about reaching Muslims before it was cool. Okay, go ahead. All right, so principle number one, share your testimony. Ooh, your story. Right? We're all about that now anyway. Yeah. The so Henry Martin yeah. got it. Share your testimony as to how you experience forgiveness of sins and peace with God through Jesus Christ. And those two components of your testimony, forgiveness of sin and peace with God, are key. And, and can I say, like, I know that some of you guys maybe grew up in the church and don't feel like you have, a, like, a dynamic testimony. You weren't, like, a gangster and shooting people and doing drugs and stuff. But, you know, like, I think to a Muslim, whenever they just hear, like you just said, Trevor, right, peace, they have peace with God. I think that's mind-blowing. And then forgiveness of sins. Right, because uh, Tre- Trevor, you had mentioned earlier in some other podcast, like uh, you know how Muslims can you know deal with their sin, right, with mm-hmm. uh, with mm-hmm. Allah, and it's um, about doing the things that they're supposed to do, right, right. But it's not really about is it is there a cleansing of sins with with Muslims? No, not not in the sense that we see it. Um, there is a whole heavy burden because they know <laughs> that even uh, the Prophet of God, Muhammad, they would say would have to. They wouldn't say he was a sinner, but they know they read in the text that he had to ask for forgiveness. And so, if he himself had these issues that he was dealing with and needed forgiveness of God, how much more do they? And so, there's a very little hope in that. And so, asking the Lord to forgive them of their sin um, is a daily thing. But I don't know that they can ever truly know. Okay. No, let me take that back. They can't truly know if their sin has been forgiven. They can say that we trust that God is merciful. That's why they can't know. So that's why if we have total peace knowing that our sins are forgiven, that God has completely forgiven our sins, it's radical to them. It's radical to say that I can approach the throne of God with confidence. Okay. That's a radical thought. Say that point again so that we can kind of review it. Say What's the point? Share your testimony as to how you've experienced forgiveness of sin and peace with God through Christ Jesus. Okay, cool. Yeah. Principle number two. All right. Remember, share your testimony. Principle number two, appreciate the best in your Muslim friends and attribute these qualities of God, these qualities to God working in their lives. All right. Appreciate the best in your Muslim friends and attribute these qualities to God working in their lives. He goes on to say, the same goes for elements of Muslim culture that are genuinely approved of by God. Okay, so let's go to the image of God. We were all created in the image of God, right? Mm -hmm. So when we see people acting out in our true natures of who God had created us to be, he says to cling to those things. Cling to those things and give God the glory. So like if you see somebody loving somebody well, even if they're not a believer attribute that quality that that person has to God working in their life. Huh. It's bigger, right? I mean, when you look at a Muslim and they say, you know, uh, I'd like you to meet my mother and my, uh, she lives with us and we care for her. I, I immediately say, man, I thank God that you've been faithful to care for your mother, to honor your mother, to honor your father that way. That's amazing. And wow. praise be to God for your faithfulness to your parents. And, you know, I can't help but think that that would be an encouragement to the missionary as well to stop seeing their people as just completely lost, hopeless, you know, like ugly or um, broken, you know, just seeing them in completely negative. But rather that this is like you're kind of looking for what God has already been doing. That's right. You're looking for where is God working in their life? Because he is. Even if we don't even if they're not believers, we can assume that God is still working. Right. So, and then there's that second part that says the same goes for elements of Muslim culture that are genuinely approved of by God. Some of you guys might be thinking, exactly what would that be? (laughs) Right. What part of that culture would be approved of by God? Well, something that comes to my mind is the hospitality. We talked about this with Shireen, right? Shireen, the the hospitality of uh, Islamic culture is um, uh, astounding. Like, I I remember when I was uh, in, uh, in Mumbai and it was Eid. And I got invited and I just started talking to a guy like, what's going on? Everyone's wearing religious garb. It was a Muslim sector. And I'm like, what's going on? And they're like, oh, we're celebrating Eid. And so they bring me into their house. I've never met these people. I just came out of my hotel room. They brought me to the house, fed me food, helped me. They asked me to help them slaughter a goat, Uh, actually Mm -hmm. two goats. And then, yeah. And then I'm eating and meeting their family. We're just talking for a couple hours. And it was amazing. And you could literally just say, I'm so thankful to God for your hospitality. Right. Clearly, I can see. This is Paul in Acts 17, right? Clearly, I can see that you're a religious people. Oh, right. 
So he's not talking to believers when he says that, but no, I, can, no. I, can, I can talk to a Muslim and say, I thank God for your hospitality. You have displayed a care for me that only comes from God, and I thank him for that. I mean, uh-huh. that's, that's okay to do. You're not, you know, somebody might be thinking, oh, but you're affirming, you know, Allah is the true God. In my mind, there is only one God, okay? So right. I'm okay with God knows who I'm talking about. <laughs> right. And which will lead to other conversations, probably. Exactly, because they might might just ask, what do you mean by God? And there we go. Here's the conversation. And and for me, when I explain God, I mean, ultimately, the, the best representation I have of God is, is Christ, right? right? Fully God, fully man. All right, number three. Uh, what was number two again? That's right. Appreciate the best in your Muslim friends. And the same goes for uh, aspects of Muslim culture that are genuinely approved of by God. Number three, keep your message centered in Christ. Speak about the grace of God and how this is transmitted through Christ. Keep it centered on Christ. Become an expert at bringing every conversation back to Jesus. Okay. So, can you give me an example? Um, let's see. So maybe, maybe they're going to ask you a question like, hey, uh, so what are your thoughts about Muhammad? And I have this principle that says, you do not have to make Muhammad look bad in order to make Jesus look good. Right. You've mentioned that before, and that's good. So take the conversation from that to go, you know, I know a couple things about Muhammad, but I'm sure I'm more interested in what you know about Muhammad. What I really know a lot about is Jesus. Could I tell you about him? Ooh. Bring it back to Jesus. Keep the message centered. Every time they try to sidetrack it, well, what do you think about Israel and Palestine? And say, you know, I think that Jesus weeps for the... Uh, the plight of the Palestinians and the plight of the Jews. He he weeps for all of mankind. And then go into a story. If they say, well, what do you think about, uh, you know, I, I know that I'm not a bad person and say, you know, I got this story about Jesus where he talks about um, his disciples. They were really mad because the disciples weren't washing their hands before the, they ate. And Jesus says, do you not know that it's not what goes into man that defiles him, but that what comes out of man defiling them? And people are really good at washing the outside of the cup. And all the while, the inside of the cup is dirty. Be really good at bringing every story back to Jesus and talking about something that he did. All right. You know, they could be like, man, it's a nice day out and be like, you know what? There's a story about Jesus and how he's able to calm the sea and calm the weather. Right. They're like, what? Tell me. I'm serious. Right. Because you, be interesting. you're laughing at me like I'm being like I'm joking, but I'm not joking. I'm being yeah. very serious and that Muslims are very interested in Jesus and keep the message centered on him. Right. That's cool. Yeah. Number three, keep the message centered on Jesus. Number four, invite your Muslim friends to study the Bible. Dave Cashin. There you go. Invite your Muslim friends to study the Bible. And don't don't say study. I know we have Bible studies. That's just weird to to <laughs> other people of another faith. It's like you study the book. Oh, like, what get, does that mean? It maybe it's like coming to a um a church event if you say let's come, you know, have a Bible study. No, I, I think it's like studying an academic text. Right. Oh, okay, yeah, that too. You, yes. re- you read the scripture. For so, them, it's we recite the, the Quran. For us, if we say study the Bible, that's weird. And they, they feel like they're not prepared. Like, it's a, is there going to be a test? Oh, or is there going to be a mom there or uh, uh, someone religious that, that has the credentials, maybe? Yeah, so just ask them, I'd, I'd like to share a story with you from scripture. And then just memorize a couple. Um, know some stories from scripture or, or ask them to read it. Would you read the story? You know, it's Christmas time and say, uh, for instance, Christmas, we talked a little bit last week about Muslims and Christmas, but then you might say to them, what do, does the Bible say anything about the birth of Jesus? Or does the Quran say anything about the birth of Jesus? And they'll say, well, yes. And there's a story about Zechariah, um, Jesus's cousin, John the Baptist. Right. There's a story of Jesus and his virgin birth from Mary. And so there's all these sort of similarities. And then you could say, would you like to read the whole story and bring them to Luke chapter two? Yeah. We just read that to the kids. Yeah. For Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. All through Advent, man. Reading. Yes. Over and over again. Advent. <laughs> God sent the angel Gabriel to the Mary. <laughs> the yes. That's right. Emmanuel means God with us. Oh, uh, yeah. Good okay. Times. Keep going. Number five, uh, pray for your Muslim friends. Oh, that's so good. Just pray for them. And I don't mean like at night when no one's around. Like, yeah, pray for them too at that time. But actually uh, ask them, how, how are you doing? Could I, could I pray for you? Um, when you go in, I, I, I make it a point if, if possible. Um, okay, good example. I just met a couple guys uh, a few weeks ago, went into their home, had some tea, hung out. And as I was leaving, I said, before I leave, can I just t- take a minute and pray and thank God for you guys and ask his blessing on your home? All three guys were like, absolutely. That's so cool. Absolutely. 
Yeah. So pray. Number six, create a favorable environment in society through good works that minister to human need. What? <laughs> That's not where I thought you were going. <laughs> I know. I know. It's like social justice, right? I yeah. mean, do good things. Do good deeds. Yeah. Do good. Drink coffee. Yeah, it's well, I mean, that, coffee. <laughs> that's the that's the worldview of the Muslim, right? Do you do good deeds? Because if you're a religious person, you will be doing good deeds. Oh, I get it. Yeah, so that's all connected, right? It's, it's almost like putting your uh, your um, putting your money where your mouth your is. Your money where your mouth is. I, I was like putting something. Some <laughs> I don't. Okay, yeah, putting your money where your mouth is. Like, do, are you really religious? Oh yeah, show me what you're doing. Okay, so uh, I know this is getting long, but I have one one quick story. Um, my wife and I met this one family and we uh, brought them cookies and we're trying to love them and share the gospel with them. But we never really got to talk to them about Jesus because their father wasn't in town. Did I share this story already? I don't think I did. I their father wasn't yeah. in town. And I had this, uh, you know, my wife and I talked about it. We thought we really don't want to be sharing things with these girls um, and the wife without the father being present. Let's wait. He'll be back eventually. And it turns out like he was gone for a while, like six months. Whoa. And so for six months, we just loved this family. Um, brought them firewood, uh, helped tutor in math, English, um, helped bring food, uh, whatever we could do to bless this family. When the father finally came home, they said, we'd like to have you over for dinner and meet our father. So we came for dinner and we sat down. And for the first 20 minutes of the meal, he just told us about how every night his family would call and say how much love they felt from our family. And this is a true story. This is a true story. How much love they had felt from our family for six months and that he knew when he got home, uh, when he sat down with us, that he wanted to communicate to us that they have never met anybody like us and that he, our, his family was now our family and that even if he wasn't there, we had his permission to be in his home with his children, with his family. It was amazing. Wow. And so I said, you know, uh, you know, as a new newly adopted son, um, I, I <laughs> do have I do have one I do have one request. Uh, I said, I've been waiting six months um, to talk to you about this because I didn't want to do it without your permission. But I would love to be able to share with your children, you and your wife, your whole family, um, what the Bible says about who Jesus is. You said that. Yeah. I said, I am a follower of Jesus. I've committed my life to following him, studying him, and I even teach about him. And I'd love to teach that to your family. And what did he say? He said, I trust because of your life. This is what's key, right? I trust because of your life that you know more about God than me. And anything you want to oh, share with my, my family, you can. Gosh, I did not expect that response. So, and and trust me, people, I am not a, I've not always been a social justice, do good type of person. I've been a very much preach the word, preach the word. And that changed my whole perspective in realizing that word and deed together is a powerful combination and that yeah. God wants us to live the gospel. What a cool story, man. Yeah. All right. Number seven. And I love this one for all our Pentecostal brothers out there. Trust the Holy Spirit. Trust that the Holy Spirit is the one who's going to work in your Muslim friend. Don't worry so much about, I have to convert them. I have to convince them. I have to do, you know, some, you know, I got to listen to truth about Muslims enough that I can have enough knowledge to go and, you know, pull out this uh, magic recipe. It's the Holy Spirit is the one who brings people to Christ. That's so good. I think a lot of people forget. I forget. Yeah, we feel like it's it's on us, but you know what? It's God's mission. Uh, he's the one who draws people to himself. It's the love of God that draws people to repentance. It's our job to introduce them to the person of Christ and allow the Holy Spirit to do the work of convicting their heart of sin. Cool. Yeah. So those are seven principles from Henry Martin. So this is the last thing that we want to say. Uh, Christmas time, we said that we were going to say something about you know Muslims and Christ, uh, Christmas and how they celebrate that kind of thing. So we're just going to give you a little blurb about it. So Trevor, uh, tell us what we've been kind of like uh, researching and thinking about and reading the Quran and yeah. You know, well, there. we were looking at the Quran and and even hearing a few different Muslim scholars talk about Christmas. And what it comes down to is that a lot of Muslims are divided on this issue because a lot of Muslims want to participate in Christmas. They want to give gifts. They want to say Merry Christmas. They want right. to have Christmas parties with their friends. Yeah. And so the hardliners, you know, are saying no, because Christmas is about 
uh, the incarnation and the accepting of Jesus as the Son of God in the Quran, you know, implicit, explicitly denies the incarnation of Christ. So they say no Merry Christmas, no Christmas for Muslims. And then the more liberal Muslims are like, well, we're really just celebrating the virgin birth of Christ, the angel Gabriel. Right, which is in uh, the Quran. Yeah, I mean, right. the angel Gabriel, you know, uh, Mary becomes pregnant, she was a virgin. She's given uh, a child who is to be a sign for all the peoples. I mean, that's right out of Luke. Um, and he is the Messiah. The Isa al Masih is the, the Quranic term for Jesus, Jesus the Messiah. And so they're okay with saying, you know, well, we want to be a part of Christmas. It's really just this kind of thing. You know, we're not celebrating Jesus as the Son of God. We're just saying that Jesus is here and it's a happy time. So Muslims are really divided about this. But I think it's a great time to talk about Jesus to your Muslim friends. Right. Just like we always said. You know, hey, what do you think about Christmas? What's going on there? What do you guys do? Do you celebrate Christian? Do you not Christmas? Do you not think you know? And it's not really that stupid of a question because I think sometimes people are like, well, of course they're not Christians. Why would they celebrate Christmas? But it's you know the virgin birth. Let me say it again: the virgin birth is in the Quran. <laughs> the virgin birth, right? Is in the Quran. <laughs> you know, uh, Zachariah is in Cor- in the Quran. I mean, this yeah, he's, Gabriel, he's made mute because he needs a sign from God that this is really going to happen. John the Baptist to be born, and the angel says, "Well, it's fine. You won't speak." <laughs> right. This is all in the Quran, you know, so it's like it's not a stupid question because they do see that that Jesus was obviously special, a prophet, a Uh, sign. He actually speaks from the cradle, a prophet. He's called a word from God. Yeah, he speaks from the cradle, uh, defending his mother's chastity and claiming his own prophetic status. Right. And uh, the gospel of Thomas, if I'm not mistaken. (laughs) So anyway, so it's not a stupid question just to see where they stand and just even talk about it then. So it's kind of cool. I think they wonder, too, like the lights, the trees, they have a lot of questions. And half the time, we don't have good answers. No, we have a lot of questions. (laughs) (laughs) One time I was putting up Christmas lights and I had a Muslim friend holding the ladder. And this was... uh, uh, I think I've talked about it before. One of a close friend of my wife and I, she was holding the bottom of the ladder and I was on a 15 foot extension ladder reaching up to like the top of a second floor trying to get lights. And I hear her and she's praying as she's holding the ladder, this rickety old ladder. And I said, hey, are you praying? And she says, yeah, I'm praying. I said, well, what are you praying? And she says, I'm praying you won't fall, inshallah. And <laughs> inshallah means if God wills. And I was like, do you mean to tell me you think God could will that I fall from this thing? She says, no, of course not. I said, why did you say inshallah? You know, it was just a really funny, funny time. But anyway, just live life with Muslims. Get to know them. Be their friends. Uh, talk about Christmas and what it means to you and especially what Jesus means to you. All right, this week's sponsors. CIU. CIU. CIU educates people from a bib- biblical biblical world review. World view. Real, w- world view. Yeah, I can't say. CIU educates people from a biblical world view to impact the nations with the message of Christ. That's it for me and Trevor. We want you to, we hope that you have a Merry Christmas and an awesome New Year. Yeah. Or have had a Merry Christmas. Hey, 12 days of Christmas, Anglicanism. Right. And then, uh, and, uh, and then a Happy New Year. Uh, God bless everybody. And thank you guys for listening. Uh, it's, a, it's a real blessing. We've been <laughs> looking up on our stats, seeing what what nations and where like our listeners Dude, are. We've got fans in Thailand. Yeah, in Turkey, Australia, in Saudi Arabia, UK, uh, yeah, Ghana, Uganda, or Ga- or Ga- Ghana. 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 Yeah. yeah. And so Portugal. We're, we're just kinda like, uh, okay. And and we keep moving up steadily on the on the automatic charts or whatever. I think our our, our highest we were like on thirty number thirty one out of yeah. on, the, on the Christian charts. We've even got like three reviews now. Right. All I, positive. I hope, hopefully there'll be more, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, even then, and and we just really are blessed that you guys would be listening. So thank you so much, and this is uh, this is it for Howard and Trevor. Yeah, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Yeah.